So last week we began with 2 John, and today we're going to finish it off. Last week was all about truth and love, and how truth and love grow and live together, and truth is all about the person of Jesus. And with that foundation, let's read verse 7 through 13, and uh, see what God has for us this morning. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such a Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out, that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching... Do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister also send their greeting. And so uh, here in 2 John, we're going to see how he's talking about some people who are coming and not promoting Jesus, and he's going to say, don't welcome those people into your home. Can you imagine living back in in John's time when he's writing this letter? And uh, it's unbelievable, really, because they didn't have electricity, and they didn't even have the internet. Imagine we just sit around all night going, what on earth are we going to do with ourselves? Bored out of our minds, don't know how to communicate with anybody around us, and if you want to make some fancy dessert for a party you're going to go to, like, how are you going to search it up? You're going to actually have to go to all your friends and find out all their creative ideas so that you can pin their best ideas and come up with something fancy to do. Or if you've got a do-it-yourself project, how do you even accomplish that? Unless you actually go and talk to somebody and get some ideas. But uh, I'm sure back then they did have some different systems in place. Do you remember when Jesus sent out his followers? He said, go two at a time. As you enter into a village, look for a man of peace. And so they'd go, and they'd enter a village, and people are a little bit skeptical. Who is this guy? We don't know him. What's he all about? But a certain person would welcome them, and they'd say, come to my house, and they'd take responsibility for them. They'd house them, they'd feed them, and then they'd invite all their friends over, and their friends, and in that, they could share all about Jesus. And uh, that's how the church grew and was established in the beginning days. And it was a special time in history where before then, there wasn't a lot of peace. There wasn't a common language. But now there was a common language and there was peace and there were roads. And so they could travel easily, a lot more easy than at any other time prior in history. And the Christians, they said, hey, this is a good opportunity. Let's take a road trip. So they'd hit the road, they'd go to a village, they'd find their man of peace, be welcomed in their house, and then that person would invite all their relatives and all their friends, and people were around because they didn't all go up north to get jobs, and so they had a huge, a huge uh, gathering of people, and they got to share about Jesus. And as churches were formed, then others would come and they'd visit the church, and they'd bring more teaching. But it wasn't just the followers of Jesus going village to village because everyone was wanting more ideas, the exchange of thoughts. Everyone was needing entertainment. And so this was actually big business. People would come into town and basically it was anyone who wanted to write a blog but there was no internet to post it on. They'd come to your village and they'd say, okay, Here we are with our good ideas. So the gluten guy, he'd come and he'd explain to everyone all about wheat. Then there's the pipeline guy and he'd say, oh, the government's against us and we need to protect the environment and all these different people. Someone would come to the village and they'd have all their different ideas and all their different forms of entertainment. Someone would be like, I've got a little quiz for you. Just answer these five questions. I'll tell you which Disney character you are. And everyone would be all excited and they'd share it with their friends and it was great fun. The best was the extreme sports guys. Because some people that come, you don't really want them in your house. And other guys were just plain old entertaining. So one guy's like, hey, I saw this squirrel and I made a suit just like his with these wings between me. Can I jump off the roof of your house, see if it works? And you'd be like, yeah, let's invite everybody over. And so maybe it was going to be a fail. Maybe it would work out. But all these different people are going through towns and promoting their ideas. And it became a big business. And it... That's at this point that John became concerned and wrote his letter. Because a lot of people would come and say, oh, you'll give me a welcome into your house and invite people over so I can talk about Jesus? Great. If I get enough hits, I might even make some money off of this. And so people were just coming through with all sorts of crazy ideas. And some people, they were legit and they loved Jesus. They followed Jesus and they strengthened the church. And others 
had ideas that were just off the wall. And so here John is writing and he's saying, you've got to be careful people. We need to know because the church is supposed to be hospitable. The church is supposed to be loving and welcoming. But what do you do now? Because John knew Jesus. He'd walked with Jesus. He'd heard Jesus. He loved Jesus deeply. And when people are coming and talking about a different Jesus, John was really concerned, not just because people's ideas would be off, but the implications of how they'd live their lives. And so, the church had to figure out how to handle this. And we can read in 2 Corinthians how Paul said, what, do I need a letter of recommendation like you? Because soon people, the church of Ephesus would write a letter and say, this guy's legit, invite him to your church, and he's got some good teaching. He'd go and he'd say, here I am, and they'd be like, okay, you can come and speak to our church. And soon as the church grew and became more of an organized structure and became more complex um, throughout church history pretty early on, they had a manual of church order. And this manual gave them tests in order to discern the traveler's doctrine, their motives and attitudes towards money, their character to know, is this someone we should invite into our house or not? So with that little bit of a background in mind, let's read this passage again. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out, that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. So what we're going to do is we're going to first look at who are these people that John is calling the deceivers, and then we're going to see what our response is to that. So John starts off and he calls these people deceivers, and he calls them the Antichrist. Pretty big words. Pretty harsh treatment here. Now deceivers, because they were bringing a teaching that was leading people astray. It was taking their eyes off of who Jesus is and what he's all about. And as people were being led astray, they were being deceived. And their whole focus and Lord was being lost. Because they were promoting a Jesus, but actually the ideas about Jesus they were promoting were against Jesus. Were anti-Jesus. And so he calls them the Antichrist. And he's not just name calling here, but he's categorizing and saying this is what the people are. And he says these people who are sending you astray, they've run ahead and don't continue in the teaching of Christ. And John is actually borrowing their own terminology. Because these people that are coming, they're saying, oh, you like Jesus, so do we. And we want so much more out of life. We want more out of our faith. We want to run ahead and get more. You often hear people today saying, we want to dig deeper. And these people are saying, we want to run ahead. But the problem was, they ran ahead and they didn't continue in the teaching of Jesus. They ran so far ahead that they left God behind. It says, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God, it tells us in verse 9. And so, John's borrowing their terminology and saying, these people, they've run ahead of Christ. Earlier in the passage, he borrowed their terminology again where he said, or he was playing with their terminology because they're like, we've got this new knowledge. We have all these new things from God that we want to tell you. And John's saying, we're not giving you a new command. We're giving you the old one. The rock solid command to love one another. So what is it that these people who are leading others astray teaching? He says in verse 7 that they do not acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh. Here's people who don't acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh. And that was based off of a whole line of thinking which led towards Gnosticism, which basically said the physical world is bad, and then you've got the, the whole spiritual world that is good. We, we want to elevate ourselves into the spiritual world. We want all this new knowledge so that we can be free from this physical world. And then with that line of thinking, they thought, wait a minute, what about Jesus? Because we know he's the Messiah, he's the Christ, God's chosen one, the, the spiritual one to come and lead us, but he's got a physical body, what's with that? 
And so they, all sorts of different theories about Jesus emerged. Because they said, God couldn't come in the flesh. Why would God want to take on flesh when the flesh is bad? And so different theories of Jesus emerged. They said, well, he couldn't have had a virgin birth because God couldn't have taken on that willingly. And they were saying stuff like, well, there's no need for the cross or the resurrection because the resurrection is just weird. If we don't want these bodies, why would Jesus be raised and have a new resurrected body? We want to get rid of these bodies and elevate ourselves by superior wisdom and elite knowledge to some spiritual plane out there. Now, of course, when they change Jesus, they change everything about how they're living and how they're functioning. And so sometimes that would play out and they're like, well, if the bodies aren't important, we just let it all go and it doesn't matter how we live. We can live large, we can party hard and it's all okay. And others would say, no, we need a real strict discipline to bring our bodies under control and make sure we have everything just right. Because it's all about a superior knowledge to them. And with their superior knowledge, it led to a superior pride and a lack of love. Change Jesus and you change your life. And they lost their love. And John's conclusion is because these people have run ahead of these teachings and not followed Jesus, they no longer have God. No Jesus, no love, no God. You've lost it all. He says they've lost their reward. In 1 John, he says sort of the same thing. If you don't love your brother, how can you say you love God? If you don't love, you don't have God. And we have God through Jesus. And we follow Jesus by believing in him, which results in a dying to ourself and a living for him. And that has to produce love as Jesus in it is in us because he's the root of our lives and the root will produce a healthy fruit which is love. So that's who these deceivers are, these people who are leading them astray. And so what is our response? Our response is, comes under the title of watch out. We're told in verse 8, watch out. And that's twofold. One is to continue in our teaching and the other is don't share in the work of these people who may lead you astray. So let's look at what it means to continue in the teaching. Halfway through verse 9 it says, whoever continues in the teaching has the, both the Father and the Son. Now it probably goes without saying, but to continue in the teaching, first of all you need to know the teaching. And uh, as these people were coming along with all sorts of different thoughts and ideas about who Jesus was and what's important, deception works best when people are isolated. When they don't have the body of Christ around them. Because deception often sounds appealing. Who doesn't want to run ahead and have more in their spiritual life? Who doesn't want to get more out of it and to tell them, hey, there's this elite knowledge, you can, you can have more knowledge and know God more? It sounds pretty appealing. But if you have the body of Christ around you, loving you, that's going to satisfy your heart. If you're on a mission together with other believers to share Jesus with the world around us, that's going to be exhilarating and to see God glorified as the mission is played out together. And to have other believers around you to help you keep you in check of what you're thinking and what you're ingesting into your life. And so we want to know our teaching. And so we want to be aware not just to do that in isolation. Next to know our teaching, our teaching comes from the Bible as we read it and are led by the Holy Spirit together with other believers. And so we want to read God's word daily. Reading the Bible is so important. Now I know it's already January 4th and most of our New Year's resolution, resolutions are a thing of the past. But here's a new one you can set. Read the Bible daily. It's so crucial. In the past, Christians have been called people of the book. Because that's what we're all about. That's how God has revealed himself to us through his word, led by the Holy Spirit. And so we want to read the Bible daily and have it a daily part of us so that we're consistently growing and being sharpened and being sent out into the world, knowing God through the reading of his word. Another way is join a class. Make sure you're part of a small group. Make sure that you're part of with other believers learning and growing. Maybe I can give a little uh, quick infomercial. There's in your bulletin, there's an ad for the story-formed way. 
a really neat class coming up in a couple of weeks, which is walking chronologically through the Bible with the main stories of the Bible. Now, the Bible's we see it in one book, but really it's a library of lots of small books. But really it's one big story. And the story formed way is going to look at the story and see how it forms our way. And so it's kind of the, here's the basics of what Christianity is all about. And often maybe you're newer to the faith or you haven't been around church for a long time and you get together with other Christians and they're talking about stuff and you're like, I'm not quite sure what you're even talking about. But join a class like the Story Formed Way that will give you the big picture so when you hear other things or you read something in the Bible, you're like, oh, okay, I can see now kind of where it fits in because it's a framework to work on. So to continue in the teaching, first we need to know the teaching. But uh, knowing the teaching is only part of it because we need to know it and then we need to continue in it. Just like John had said earlier, to walk in the truth. Not just know the truth, but walk in it. Live it out. Allow it to be in our lives and leading our lives. And what is this teaching? Well, specifically John was speaking against those who were saying Jesus didn't come in the flesh. And so we want to know the teaching. What does it mean that Jesus came in the flesh? Because here we have Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, eternally God from eternity past, and then he took on human flesh. And so we affirm that Jesus is fully man, and Jesus is fully God. He's fully man in that in the past, or it, it, the Christmas story tells us about the virgin birth where Jesus took on flesh. That time where God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world to become one of us. And Jesus had a fully human body. He got tired, he got thirsty, he got hungry, his body died. And when he rose from the dead, he rose still with a physical body. His resurrected body was a physical body. Yes, it was made perfect and it was no longer subject to weakness disease or death, but it was a physical body. And Jesus wanted his followers to know that and to understand that. He said, see my hands and my feet? It's I, myself, not a spirit, for I have flesh and bones, he said in Luke 24, 39. And he wanted to demonstrate that he had a physical body, so he took the fish and he ate it. Jesus ascended into heaven in that same physical body, and he's going to return that way because he's fully man. He had a human mind. He had to increase in wisdom. He had to learn obedience. He didn't know the hour of his return. He had human emotions in a soul. Often he'd pray, my soul is troubled within me. Or he'd marvel with his emotions. He'd marvel at the faith of the centurion. And uh, he'd weep. He'd weep for Lazarus. He'd weep over Jerusalem. And the people that knew Jesus best, that grew up with him, saw Jesus as fully man. And then when he started doing miracles and things, they're like, who is this guy? We know him. He's the carpenter's son. There's his brothers and his sisters. And they knew that he was fully man. And yet, being fully man, Jesus was sinless. Why was Jesus' humanity necessary? Well, for one, he obeyed where we couldn't obey. He's our representative in obedience. He was the substitute for us to take away our sins. He was a mediator between God and men, as a man. And though he fulfilled God's original purpose for man to rule over creation. Ephesians tells us that now everything is in subject to him. He's the pattern for life. Now we're being formed into his image. He's the pattern for these, the redeemed bodies, the resurrected bodies that we're going to get. Because he's the first fruit. And he can sympathize as a high priest because he was tempted in every way like we've been studying in Hebrews in the fall time. Jesus is fully man forever. He's fully man, but he's also fully God. Becoming man, Jesus didn't give up any of his deity. And the words that the Bible uses to describe Jesus, it calls him God, the word theos. It calls him Lord, Kyrios, many, many times throughout the scriptures. Jesus labeled himself. He said, before Abraham was born, I am. And the people recognized when he said, I am, it's a direct claim to his deity. And they picked up stones to stone him because they didn't understand and they thought it was blasphemy. Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He's all-powerful. He could calm the storms, multiply loaves, turn water into wine. And he did these miracles, not just because the Holy Spirit was in him, 
but to manifest his own glory, we're told in John 2.11. He's also all-knowing. He knew the thoughts of men. He knew who would betray him. Peter confessed, Lord, you know everything. The act of God is to forgive sins, and that's what Jesus did. God in the Old Testament would say, thus says the Lord, and Jesus says, and I say to you, using his language as if he is God himself, because he's fully God. Jesus is worthy to be worshipped. Now why Jesus being fully God, does that matter? Only an infinite God could bear the full penalty of our sins. Salvation is from the Lord, and so Jesus being fully God is the one who could save us. Also to be a mediator between God and man. And so Jesus is fully man and he's fully God. In respect to his human nature, we could say, Jesus grew tired and weak and he slept in the back of the boat. And in respect to his divine nature, we can say, Jesus calmed the storm and commanded creation. In respect to his human nature, we could say, Jesus was 30 years old. In respect to his divine nature, we could say, Jesus has eternally existed. In respect to his human nature, Jesus died. In respect to his divine nature, he was able to raise himself from the dead. And so remaining what he was, eternally God, he became what he was not. Jesus didn't give up any of his deity when he became a man, but he took on humanity that he didn't have before. So the teaching is, is that Jesus has come in the flesh, the God-man, the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas. And then our view of Jesus leads our lives. It allows us to put our faith in him, to be a rock-solid confidence in who he is as the one who is able to save us and to take away our sins. And then our view of Jesus also leads to how we view our own bodies as a temple of the Holy Spirit, but as a mortal body that one day will be replaced with the immortal physical body that we'll one day have. And so it allows us to not say, I'm just going to not worry about my body. I'll eat whatever I want. I'll do whatever I want with it. Because we know that here we are, created by Jesus to glorify God in our bodies. And we're not going to elevate these bodies to a position that they're not meant to be because these are just a temporary housing one day waiting for the eternal physical body that God will give us. And so when suffering and hardship comes along. We don't have to be worried and say, whoa, I want to avoid that at all costs. Or when we have faced hardships and trials and we step out of our comfort zone to be able to share Jesus with others, we're living a life of faith and not a life of just trying to preserve what we have here. So when the doctor tells you, you know what, you've got bad news in your body, we don't say, that's the end of the world. We say, that's tough. It's going to be a long road ahead. But the physical struggles that we have now aren't even worth comparing with the eternal glory that we'll have in the future, 2 Corinthians 4 tells us. And so, Jesus came in the flesh, fully man and fully God. And as we walk by faith, we have the Father and the Son. Verse 9 tells us, whoever continues in this teaching has both the Father and the Son. And in verse 8, it tells us that we'll be rewarded fully. Knowing Jesus and following him and continuing him allows us to participate with God. He's God as part of our lives. He leads us. He strengthens us. Well, Christ is in us. And so we're not living by our own strength, but we're living in the strength and the power of Jesus. And so we don't lose our reward. We gain it fully. And then our joy is complete. Just like it says in verse, uh, verse 12, that our joy is complete as we're walking in this. And there's so many rewards that Jesus wants to bless us with. And so we're told to watch out because there's all sorts of people out there and they're leading us astray. And we're told, watch out. We need to continue in this teaching. And so that's kind of the positive, the forward momentum. Carry on in the teaching. Know Jesus more and follow him. And then there's kind of the negative aspect where he says, don't welcome those people into your home because you'll share in their wicked work. And so we need to ask the question, who are you letting into your home? Verse 10, let's read it again. It tells us, if anyone comes and does not bring this teaching, don't take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. 
Here we've got John, the apostle of love, who's commanded in the first half of this book to love. Last week we talked all about truth and love and how they work together. And truth isn't knowing the right answer. Truth is knowing the right person. And truth is knowing Jesus and that produces love. And walking in truth brings about unity. It unites us together as a family. It draws us together and it builds us up. But now we've got people who are coming who aren't walking in the truth. And now truth divides. Truth separates. Truth exposes lies and it shows what is false. And as John's talking about not accepting those people into your home, he's gone to great lengths in this short little book to make sure that love is paramount. And now, love doesn't mean that we agree with everybody. Do you got that? Because we can love somebody and disagree with them. But as we disagree with people, let's remember that love, it's gentle. That love is humble. It's self-sacrificing and giving. It's putting others first. And where the world tells us, if you disagree with someone, you hate them. And we've seen far too many examples of that being played out. Of people showing hate and spewing hate in the name of telling the truth and disagreeing with others. We see too many examples of that. And John's concerned that even as we disagree with people, that we show love. We're commanded to show love. One of the ways that is really helpful to show love with those who we disagree with is to represent them fairly. Now, we don't want to compare their worst with our best. That's just not fair. So let's represent them fairly. And when we summarize what they're about and their teaching, let's do that in a way where they'd be able to nod and say, yep, you've, you've nailed me. You understand what I'm thinking and what I'm all about. From that point, yeah, we're able, just like John did, to say, you know what? The message they're bringing is leading people astray, and we disagree with it. It's deceptive. But let's not go name-calling. John's categorizing them. He's calling them deceivers and antichrists, but he's not driven by fear. Because if you're driven by fear, you want to attack them. Oh, no, those people over there, they're a threat. And now I'm afraid, so what do I do? Let's call them names. Let's attack them. Let's belittle them. We don't want to do that at all. We want to show love and respect. And if we categorize and we do end up calling them deceivers, let's not do that out of pride, where we're saying, yeah, I'm way better than you, and belittle those guys because they're, they're trash. We, don't want, we want to show love even to the people that we disagree with. Now, love will grow soft if not strengthened by truth. And truth will grow harsh, if not strengthened by love. And so we need the truth and the love to be able to work together. Now, as John is talking about not inviting these people into home, there's some parameters that he has there. First of all, he's saying these people, they're false teachers. It's not just some random guy in the marketplace that you disagree with, but they're officially out there to, permit, to present their materials. They're also on an official visit. He says, if anyone comes to you with this teaching, they're on an official visit, he says, don't welcome them into your house. And uh, in the Greek I read in the commentaries, it's literally, don't welcome them into the house. Now, back then, they didn't have church facilities and buildings. They'd meet in people's homes. And so as the person with the biggest house, they'd call the church together, and they'd say, come meet in my house. And people are like, hey, where are you going? I'm going to, going to church. I'm going to meet together with the church. They're going to the house where the church met. And John is saying, don't welcome those people into the house. In other words, don't give them the platform. Don't allow someone to come and teach about Jesus when they don't know Jesus. And so guard the teaching in front of the family of believers. And I'm sure John wouldn't mind if we said, I'm not even going to welcome them into my house. Come and stay overnight and I'm going to fellowship with you and I'm going to promote your work and feed you and bring my friends to... John wants us to know not to not share in these people's work. And these people, their specific application is the people who are saying, Jesus didn't come in the flesh. And I'm sure we could broaden that to anyone who is leading us astray from Jesus. And so for, they had the huge job of discerning. Okay, are we going to welcome these people or aren't we? 
And John's writing to a body of believers, not just an individual. And the body of believers had the job together to help discern, is this teaching we're going to accept or not? Are we going to welcome them or not? And once they did the job of discerning, then it was easy. I'm sorry, we believe Jesus came in the flesh and that's really important that Jesus is fully man and they're like, whoa, I don't like that teaching. I know, we disagree with you. I'm sorry, we can't bring you into our house and uh, try and help them understand Jesus more. So what do we do with this passage? We're in a different time, a different culture, in a different place and Christmas time comes over and your in-laws are going to come and stay for a few days and you're like, really? Do we, do we really have to have them over? And you're like, oh, wait a minute. My in-laws aren't believers. So uh, right here it says, don't welcome them into your house. Free ticket, not going to have them over. I don't think that's the intent of this passage. This passage is for the false teachers on an official visit, and I'm showing their belief. Or how about those people at work, friends or co-workers, who are all, they've got this thing against Jesus, and they're wanting to talk against Jesus. Is this a no-contact rule? Just shun them, never look at them, never talk to them, just ignore them? I don't think it's a new no contact rule primarily because the Holy Spirit's been given in our lives for us to be a witness to the world around us and we're to be a witness to those who don't yet know Jesus. Some are going to be hostile and harsh and some aren't going to, going to be just apathetic and kind of laissez-faire. But we're to go to these people so it's not a no contact rule with them. And often you've got to ask, well, what if someone knocks on your door and wants to talk to you about a Jesus who the Bible doesn't talk about? And I know there's a lot of different responses that we have. The one thing I'd say is, is it a two-way conversation? Or are they just coming to monologue and they're not willing to listen at all? And also, make sure you're part of a fellowship of believers who are sharpening you and strengthening you so you're not in isolation. Otherwise, deception can sound pretty appealing. I think the big question for us is, Partly, who do you allow into your home? But also, what do you allow into your home? What ideas? What thoughts? What priorities in life are you allowing into your home? And there's a lot of different doorways into our house. You've got all the Facebook articles that you read. You've got all the different social medias that you get input and are things to be able to kind of tell you what's important. We've got the talk shows that we listen to and people who give us counsel, whether they're a friend or a professional. And there's so many avenues of information coming into our lives, into our minds and our hearts. And I think we need to give careful attention to what we're allowing into our lives. And I think each of us needs to wrestle with that. Of what am I allowing to infiltrate my mind, to influence me, to shape my priorities, to set the trajectory of my life. And not just for me, but for my family and for my kids. We want to watch out, like John tells us. And in watching out, we want to make sure that we're not being infiltrated and opening up doors to teaching that's going to lead us again, um, away from Jesus. Because there's a lot of really good teaching out there telling us we need to be loving and kind and very good, moralistic, hardworking people. And you don't even need Jesus to do that. You can just do it on your own. There's a lot of great articles and teaching telling us you've got the power in your own life because you're inherently a good person just to better your own life. And as you better your own life, you don't even need a savior to rescue you from the evil that's in your heart. There's a lot of good teaching that we read and that we um, bring into our lives that tells you, you get to decide what's right and wrong. As long as you're tolerant and as long as you're kind, you get to decide what's right and wrong. You don't need a Lord or a Master telling you that. Watch out. Be on guard. And in 2015, I pray that we be a church that resolves to say no to ideas that are coming in that are going to lead us astray from who Jesus is. That we're willing to turn off a show, even if it's really exciting and informational, and we're willing to set down an article and push things aside so that we can focus on continuing in the teaching, not allowing bad teaching in, and filling ourselves with the good teaching about who Jesus is. Because Jesus is so amazing. This isn't just a killjoy command of, yeah, don't go do all those other things. This is a command to fill us to the full measure of joy. John is writing this, 
And he's writing it. He says, and I want to come to you face to face. Literally, he's saying, mouth to mouth, I want to speak with you. And as I do that, he's going to tell them all about Jesus and how amazing Jesus is. And the purpose? So our joy may be complete. He wants us to experience the full reward of knowing Jesus and walking in Jesus.